Hey folks, Winston for Carbide 3D here. Ever since I spent more time than any sane person should machining a camp knife out of tool steel on a desktop CNC, I felt compelled to make a smaller knife to keep at my desk that doesn't look so ridiculous. The OG camp knife with a 4 inch blade is just a bit too unwieldy for stabbing boxes, opening letters, and whatever else it is that people do with knives. But with so little free time these days, I figured my time would be better spent leaving the bladesmithing to the experts and instead focusing on customizing a knife by designing my own scales. The idea was that I could scan the shape of any knife into my computer, reverse engineer a digital model from that scanned image, and machine scales that would fit my knife perfectly. Long story short, that process will easily get you a good result, but there are some complications for getting a perfect result. But I'll explain all of that as we go along. So I started this whole thing by going online and finding a knife that I liked. Now my plan was to design knife scales that would fit extremely closely to the profile of the knife, cut them out of the rich light that we sell, and sand everything down at the end to achieve a perfect fit. Rich light is essentially compressed paper and resin, and if you want to see more about it, we've done a video about this material before that I'll link to in the description. Much like Micarta or G10, it has a unique feel and weight in hand because of the paper fibers in it. It has a matte appearance, though you can buff it to a low gloss. The cured resin that permeates the fibers and holds them together allows the material to retain fine details when machined. That also makes it naturally water resistant. So in the context of a knife, Rich Light is actually a pretty good fit and competitively priced compared to some other handle materials. But I couldn't start designing my knife scales until my blade arrived, because I didn't know exactly what the shape of the handle was. The seller I got my knife from didn't include a drawing or PDF of the handle shape, so I'm going to resort to a quick and dirty reverse engineering technique and use a scanner to capture the profile of the knife. And no, not a fancy 3D scanner like this one, I mean a 2D flatbed scanner. This is a simple, accessible way to capture an image of a part without much distortion or skewing. Once I have a JPEG image of my knife, I can bring it into a CAD program to design a set of scales. Now, I'm using Fusion because that's what I'm comfortable with, but the process I'm going to go through is applicable to basically any CAD program. For example, in Carbide Create Pro, I can roughly trace the profile of this handle with a polyline, then I'll use a circle and boolean subtraction operation to notch out the finger groove. I'll keep the checkbox for keeping the original vectors selected in case I need to tweak the positions of something down the road later. Next, I'll use the 3D modeling side of Carbide Create Pro to extrude this knife into a 3D shape. This method brings out a shape that's akin to stretching a piece of rubber over your profile and inflating it like a balloon. Then you can use 3D roughing and finishing toolpaths to cut this shape out. Totally serviceable if a simple rounded handle works for you, and probably reasonably comfortable too. Alternatively, in Alibre Atom 3D, you could bring in your scanned knife picture as a tracing image, sketch around the outline, extrude the profile, and sculpt this block down into something more ergonomic than a brick. This 3D model can then be exported as an STL file or a step file and brought into MeshCam, where you could go through some roughing and finishing toolpaths for your scales. Now, since I want to get a little fancier with my toolpathing, and I'm also just more comfortable in the environment, I'm going to use Fusion 360 for my actual knife scales. So, to hammer this home for a third time, and perhaps in a little more detail, to model the knife scales in Fusion 360, I first imported the scanned image as a canvas, making sure to scale this as close to the actual size as possible. Ideally, you would have some known feature like hole diameters or patterns that you can measure. Scanning a reference feature like a ruler next to your knife wouldn't be a bad idea either. Also, if the size of your scanned image corresponds to a known size like a standard sheet of paper, that helps too. I'll trace over this image and then extrude out that shape to begin sculpting my scale. Now, I'm going to gloss over a lot of how I arrived at this final shape, both because this isn't supposed to be a Fusion 360 tutorial, and because honestly, I felt like I was heaping chamfers and fillets onto this model in a pretty ugly way. I will make this model available to look at though if you're interested, but be warned, a lot of these fillet radii are right at the limits of breaking Fusion 360's modeling engine. The end result though is that I think I have something with an outer shape that will fit the contours of my hand and also the profile of my knife handle. And I also have features on the inside for locating pins and weight reduction. Before committing to fully machining this model though, I wanted to make sure that I had an accurate profile of the knife handle. Visually, this looks pretty good, but what looks good on paper or a screen may not hold up in real life. 
Cutting this shape out of something like MDF would be a nice quick option, but I think an even easier and lazier option would be to just make it on a 3D printer. You only need to print out a millimeter or two of the model to verify the fit. That makes this really quick to prototype and uses only a few grams of filament, which is great because I'm about to run out of PLA on the printer I have in my office. In 12 minutes, with almost zero effort, I was able to test my first attempt at matching the knife handle profile, and it came out remarkably good. And 15 minutes after that, I had a revised version that was even better. I iterated a couple more times, but I think a reasonable person might stop after about three or four iterations. The reason it's hard to scan and duplicate a flawless profile of this knife is because the image sensor and the light source in the flatbed scanner are slightly offset. If the face of the knife isn't perfectly flat, if the edge of the steel has a small radius where it meets the glass, the scanned image is going to give a false impression of where the knife handle boundaries actually are. Whoever polished up this knife so that it would look good to the buyer was a little too aggressive on the buffing wheel. They let parts of the finger groove get rounded over. That's going to create a false shiny edge that leaves me with a vague idea of where the actual groove begins and ends. One more thing to keep in mind is that this knife blank was made by laser cutting. Laser cut metals have a kerf with a widening cone of metal vaporization. They don't cut perfectly vertical walls. So depending on which side of the knife you scan, these pinholes and this slot will appear larger or smaller. If you want to match them, you'll have to break out the calipers or pin gauges to see which side has the limiting diameter. The outside is ground down though, so you won't see as much dimensional variance there. Taken together, these features will give you a small margin of error to work with, usually just a couple pixels wide, but it's error nonetheless. That works out to like plus or minus 0.2 or 0.3 millimeters depending on the resolution of your scanner and the severity of the complicating factors with whatever it is you're scanning. Now that I know that I have a knife scale that fits extremely closely to the original knife profile thanks to rapid prototyping, I can create both left and right halves by mirroring my original model and do some final checks and tweaks to optimize my scales. One of the constraints I want my design to respect is the layer thickness of each color in my rich light. I don't want the tan layer peeking through the outermost surface in just a couple spots. That's what happened in this early prototype I made off camera earlier. Those tan bits look more like blemishes than accents, so I have to be super sure that my sculpting and extruded cuts for the ergonomics largely stay within a 1.8mm thick band at the top of the rich light. Slicing up my knife scales along horizontal planes that reflect the actual layup of the rich light and colorizing these layers helps to visualize and confirm this. The other thing I learned from that early knife scale prototype was that slapping nearly 8mm thick scales onto a knife was just way too much. It felt super chonky in hand. My solution would be to skim 1mm off the bottom face of each scale. That'll keep a thin black layer as a liner between the tan and the steel while reducing the bulk of the scales to something more reasonable. To aid in making toolpaths later, I'm going to model a 6.9mm thick block of material as a placeholder that fits around my scales, which are 6.8mm thick. Within this placeholder, I'll also include holes in it to receive quarter-inch dowel pins as locating features. One face of this placeholder is going to be coplanar with the inside face of the knife scales. Okay, so now that I'm done in the 3D modeling workspace, how do we machine these scales? Well, since the bottom of the knife scales are flat, we're going to have to cut that side first because that allows us to flip everything over and stick it down with double-sided tape later. My first setup in Fusion is going to reference both the left and right scales as well as my stock placeholder. I'm using the edges of the placeholder to define the orientation of my cutting coordinates since the way I mirrored my scales doesn't line up nicely with the original coordinate system. I am also going to use the front right corner as my origin and that's just personal preference. In the second tab of the setup window, I'm going to tell Fusion I have 1mm of extra material above my model that needs to be machined away since my rich light is about 7.9mm thick. Operation number one is to bore my small pinholes using a 16th inch end mill. The ordering of this is just to minimize the number of tool changes I have to do. Next, I'll face my stock using an 8th inch end mill. Then I'll cut out the lightweighting pockets. If you're wondering about how to approach rich light from a speeds and feeds perspective, think about its constituent parts, resin and cellulose, not too different from epoxy and wood. So rich light can be treated like a nice dense hardwood. You can even machine it using a down cutting end mill. 
As a point of reference for this pocketing operation, I'm cutting at 20,000 RPM, 1800 millimeters per minute, and with a step down of 0.75 millimeters. That's about 70 inches per minute and a 132nd inch step down. One step that's optional but I like to do is to pre-bore part of the lanyard hole with generous stock to leave. Since it's harder to evacuate chips and dust from deep cavities, doing this makes it easier on the cutter later when I'm finishing this hole from the other side. It won't have as much work to do as it gets towards the bottom. Next, I'll bore the holes from my locating pins. I always use some negative stock to leave for features that are going to have a tight fit. This is to account for the fact that holes and other internal features often end up a little undersized, and that's just physics. If you think about what happens during machining, as an end mill is spinning and slicing into stock, the cutting edge and the material are fighting each other. They want to resist and push themselves apart. For the most part though, they don't, because your stock is held in place by your work holding, and your spindle is propelled relentlessly by your CNC. But at the microscopic scale, even as your end mill slices into the stock, there's still a little bit of movement and deflection, so you usually don't end up cutting away as much as you intended. Anywhere from half a thousandth of an inch to three thousandths of an inch of adjustment in diameter may be in order depending on your machine and your material. The value I'm using here came about from trial and error. The last operation to do on the back side of the knife scales is to cut out my partially completed parts according to the boundary of my stock placeholder model. That leaves me with this, a rectangular chunk of rich light that's ready to be shaped into an ergonomic handle. There's actually some housekeeping we need to do before we cut those out though. First, we need a surface that we trust to be perfectly flat. This chunk of wood that Kevin was messing around with should be perfect. I'll make a simple facing toolpath to deck off the top, and that's goodbye Mr. Aston Martin. Then I need to make the holes that will allow me to locate my rich light blank, and I can actually do this using the same fusion models I have already in this project. I'll make a setup with only the stock placeholder selected using the top of one of my locating holes as the origin. Then I'll make a simple boring operation for the quarter inch holes, and run that on my wooden block after eyeballing a point somewhere on the center line as my X axis zero. From here on out, you can't mess with the X and Y zero position. Everything is already lined up perfectly. I will, however, offset the Z axis zero up by six thousandths of an inch because that's how thick my double-sided tape is. Making the toolpaths for the outer faces of the scales starts with the setup. My origin is the bottom of the hole that corresponds to the hole in my fixture that I zeroed out previously. A 3D pocketing toolpath is used to rough away the majority of the material. I'm constraining this toolpath to the outline of my part plus a small margin. I only care about erasing the material that's immediately surrounding the scales rather than the whole volume of my stock. A boring operation opens up the lanyard hole, and here I'm slowing down the feed rate by 50% for better surface finish. This lets the end mill basically polish its way down. A 2D contour cleans up most of the vertical walls of the scales but leaves an onion skin. A 3D toolpath with generous stock to leave smooths the top surface of the scales, leaving behind a consistent layer of excess material on top. This will make things easier for my ball end mill later. And then, the last thing this flat end mill needs to do is to fully cut through the onion skin. Again, I slowed down the feed rate by 50% versus my roughing feed rate to get a nicer, smoother wall finish. More machining time, but less hand sanding is worth it any day of the week. Then, it's time for an eighth inch ball nose end mill to put in some work. Normally, if you want a smooth 3D surface, you pick a small step over. But if you pick a coarser step over, like 1.5mm, you can do something more interesting with your toolpath. Here I'm using two opposing parallel finishing toolpaths to create a diamond texture across the face of my scales. The parallel toolpaths are programmed to only touch areas of the scales that are relatively shallow. And to machine the steeper areas where I don't have any need for fancy texturing, I'll call upon a 3D contour toolpath with a small step down to smoothly define these slopes. This is what we're left with, 
I think these look great and they feel really grippy without being too harsh in hand like sandpaper. But while I have my Shapeoko HDM set up for knife scale machining, we might as well have a little more fun and do another variation on this texturing. If instead of a parallel toolpath I use a radial toolpath, I can get a pattern that looks like this. It isn't as grippy, but I think it's a pretty cool look nonetheless. I think in comparison, it actually makes the first set of scales look a bit too... tactical. But I'm honestly torn. I think both grips would work really well on this knife. If you have any strong feelings about which one you'd prefer, post them in the comments below. I will attach whichever is the more popular design to this knife in one week's time. I hope this video gave you a taste of what's possible with an engineered material like Rich Light, and also what you can do with some creative applications of toolpaths. If you want to dissect my cam setups for yourself, I'll make the Fusion file available to download via a link in the description below. Until next time, good luck and have fun machining, folks.